In 2007, Lou was arrested for running a big investment scheme. One of the biggest Ponzi schemes in American history. Lou Pearlman's story is a saga of ambition, success, and scandal, painting a complex picture of a man who forever changed the music industry while simultaneously orchestrating one of the largest financial frauds in American history. Lou Pearlman's childhood fascination with blimps was more than just a youthful whim. It was the spark that ignited his entrepreneurial spirit and set the stage for a career marked by grand ambitions and audacious ventures. This early interest in airships was not merely a passing fancy, but a deep-seated passion that Perlman would carry into his adult life, eventually leading him to embark on his first significant business endeavor in the early 1980s, the blimp business. Launching a business centered around blimps in that era was a bold move. Blimps, or non-rigid airships, were a symbol of innovation and grandeur, evoking images of a bygone era when they were the giants of the skies. For Perlman, the blimp business was not just a commercial venture, it was a venture into a world of wonder and possibility. He saw in blimps not just an opportunity for profit, but a chance to be part of something larger than life, something that captivated the imagination and soared above the ordinary. Perlman's foray into the blimp industry was his proving ground, the arena where he honed his skills as a businessman and entrepreneur. It required not just capital and resources, but vision, persistence, and an ability to navigate the complexities of a niche market. The challenges were immense, from the technical intricacies of airship construction and maintenance to the logistics of operation and the task of securing clients in a highly specialized field. Yet, Perlman approached these challenges with the zeal of a true entrepreneur, driven by a conviction that his blimps could rise above the competition and carve a niche in the aerial advertising and entertainment industry. As Perlman's blimp business took flight, it evolved, much like the airships themselves, into something broader and more ambitious. The business expanded its horizons, transitioning from blimps to a private airline charter business. This evolution was a natural progression for Perlman, a step up from the slow-moving grace of blimps to the speed and efficiency of airplanes. The charter business was not just a new venture. It was a leap into a highly competitive and lucrative industry, one that demanded a keen understanding of market dynamics, impeccable service, and an ability to cater to an elite clientele. His private airline charter business also set the stage for his eventual encounter with the music industry when he chartered a flight for the band New Kids on the Block. Struck by the immense success of the boy band, Perlman realized the lucrative potential of the music industry and decided to pivot his career toward creating the next big musical sensation. In order to transition from the world of aviation to the glitzy and cutthroat music industry, Lou Perlman moved to Florida. His ambitions were clear and audacious, to create a musical phenomenon that would rival the success of New Kids on the Block. With this goal in mind, Perlman began hosting auditions, scouring the Sunshine State for talent that would bring his vision to life. It was a quest for the perfect blend of charisma, talent, and appeal, elements he believed were essential to form the ultimate boy band. The audition process was exhaustive and rigorous, with Perlman leaving no stone unturned in his search for stars. He understood that success in the music industry was not just about having a good voice or a pretty face. It was about chemistry, about finding individuals who could not only sing and dance, but also connect with audiences on an emotional level. Perlman was not just assembling a band, he was engineering a cultural phenomenon. Perlman's perseverance paid off when he formed the Backstreet Boys, a group that would become synonymous with the boy band craze of the 1990s. The success of the Backstreet Boys was meteoric, propelling Perlman into the spotlight as the mastermind behind the sensation. But Perlman was not content with creating just one successful band. He replicated his success with NSYNC, another group that would rise to global fame, captivating audiences with their melodies and dance moves. And then came Innocence, a band that briefly included future pop icon Britney Spears, adding another layer to Perlman's growing musical empire. Perlman's Midas touch in forming these bands earned him the title Father of Boy Bands. He had fundamentally reshaped the music industry, creating a template for boy band success that others would try to emulate for years to come. 
His bands were more than just musical acts. They were brands, cultural icons that defined a generation. The success stories of the Backstreet Boys and NSYNC were testaments to Perlman's vision and his uncanny ability to tap into the pulse of the music market. However, behind the facade of chart-topping hits and sold-out concerts lay a darker reality. The very artists who were the face of Perlman's success were also the victims of his ruthless business practices. Despite their global fame and the relentless work they put into their careers, the band members were financially exploited. Contracts were structured in a way that funneled the lion's share of the earnings back to Perlman and his companies, leaving the artists with a meager income that was starkly disproportionate to their success. This exploitation was not just a betrayal of trust, it was a glaring paradox in the glamorous narrative of boy band fame. The members of these bands were adored by millions, their faces plastered on posters in bedrooms across the world, yet the rewards of their labor were siphoned away by the very person who had brought them together. The realization of this exploitation would eventually lead to legal battles as the band members sought to reclaim what was rightfully theirs. During this tumultuous period, Lou Pearlman's activities extended far beyond the realm of the music industry. While he was orchestrating the careers of some of the biggest names in pop music, he was also engineering a financial fraud of colossal proportions. The Ponzi scheme he masterminded was not merely an act of financial impropriety, it was a calculated, systemic draining of the life savings of unsuspecting investors, a deceit that would eventually rank among the most egregious in history. The core of Perlman's financial machinations was the Employee Investment Savings Account, a deceptive investment vehicle that he pitched to investors as a safe, secure, and lucrative opportunity. With the promise of FDIC insurance, investors were led to believe that their investments were protected that their trust was placed in the hands of a reliable and regulated financial institution. However, the reality was starkly different. The supposed safety net was a mirage, a fabrication that concealed the perilous nature of the scheme. Perlman's strategy was simple, yet devastatingly effective. He used the funds from new investors to pay returns to earlier ones, creating the illusion of a profitable, thriving investment venture. This cycle of deceit not only kept the scheme afloat, but also helped it grow, attracting more investors, drawn in by the lure of steady returns and the apparent legitimacy of Perlman's operations. The facade of success was bolstered by the high-profile nature of Perlman's other business ventures, particularly in the music industry, which added a veneer of credibility to his financial dealings. The funds siphoned from investors were not just used to perpetuate the scheme, they also fueled Perlman's extravagance. He led a life of opulence, marked by luxury properties, private jets, and extravagant parties. This lavish lifestyle was not just a display of wealth. It was a calculated move to project the image of a successful, affluent businessman, a persona that would attract more investors to his fraudulent scheme. Perlman's financial empire was a complex network of companies and investments interwoven in a way that made it difficult to discern the legitimate from the fraudulent. He shuffled funds between various accounts and businesses, using the money from his Ponzi scheme to plug financial gaps in his other ventures and vice versa. This intricate web of transactions was not just a means of financial management. It was a deliberate strategy to obfuscate, to blur the lines between his legitimate business activities and his fraudulent ones. As the scheme grew, so did the stakes. The amount of money involved reached staggering proportions, with over $300 million defrauded from investors. The scale of the fraud was such that it not only ruined the financial lives of countless individuals, but also sent shockwaves through the investment community, undermining trust in the financial system and the regulatory mechanisms meant to protect investors. However, as with all Ponzi schemes, the facade eventually began to crumble. The relentless pursuit of new investors the increasing difficulty in maintaining the illusion of profitability, and the growing scrutiny from authorities and investors alike led to the unraveling of Perlman's deceitful empire. When the scheme finally collapsed, it exposed not just the financial devastation it had wrought, but also the audacity and ruthlessness of the man behind it. Lou Perlman's trial and conviction in 2008 were the culmination of his years of fraudulent activities marking the end of his financial empire and his status as a music mogul. The trial was a significant legal proceeding, 
given the scale of his Ponzi scheme and the number of individuals and entities affected by his actions. Perlman was charged with multiple counts of conspiracy, money laundering, and making false statements during a bankruptcy proceeding. The charges stemmed from his orchestration of the Ponzi scheme that defrauded investors of over $300 million and his mismanagement and exploitation of the boy bands he produced. The trial revealed the extent of his deceit, including the fabrication of financial statements, the establishment of fictitious companies to attract investors, and the misuse of investors' funds for personal gain. The proceedings were complex, involving a multitude of witnesses, including defrauded investors, former band members, and financial experts who dissected Perlman's intricate web of financial transactions. The prosecution presented a detailed account of Perlman's fraudulent activities, painting a picture of a man whose ambition and greed led him to perpetrate one of the largest and most audacious financial frauds in recent history. Perlman's defense, on the other hand, faced the daunting task of countering the overwhelming evidence presented by the prosecution. The defense team attempted to mitigate the severity of the charges, arguing for leniency based on Perlman's contributions to the music industry and the economic benefits his businesses had generated. However, the sheer scale of the financial damage caused by his actions, coupled with the personal testimonies of those defrauded, made the defense's position challenging. The legal proceedings against Lou Perlman were a high-stakes drama, unfolding in a courtroom where the contrasting strategies of the prosecution and defense clashed, each side weaving their narratives to sway the judgment of the law. Perlman, once a towering figure in the music industry, found himself ensnared in the legal system, his future hanging in the balance as the intricate details of his extensive financial fraud were laid bare for scrutiny. The prosecution, armed with a trove of evidence and testimonies, meticulously built a case that portrayed Perlman as the architect of one of the largest Ponzi schemes in American history. Central to their strategy was the task of unraveling Perlman's complex web of financial transactions, fictitious businesses, and fraudulent accounts. The prosecution aimed to expose the full extent of Perlman's deception, revealing how he used the allure of his successful music ventures to attract investors to his scheme. The heart of their narrative painted a picture of a man whose greed knew no bounds, a man who callously defrauded investors, including many who had entrusted him with their life savings. The prosecution's case was bolstered by the emotional testimonies of the victims, who took the stand to recount the devastation Perlman's actions had wrought upon their lives. These personal stories added a visceral element to the financial data and legal arguments, grounding the proceedings in the stark reality of human suffering caused by Perlman's greed. In contrast, Perlman's defense team faced the monumental task of countering the avalanche of evidence presented by the prosecution. Their strategy hinged on casting doubt on the malicious intent attributed to Perlman, portraying him instead as an ambitious entrepreneur whose ventures, while aggressively pursued, were never meant to defraud. The defense argued that Perlman's actions were those of a visionary, albeit one whose financial management was flawed and misguided, rather than criminally deceptive. The defense also sought to exploit legal loopholes and procedural technicalities, challenging the admissibility of certain pieces of evidence and questioning the credibility of some of the prosecution's witnesses. They navigated the complexities of financial law, attempting to dissociate Perlman's legitimate business activities from the fraudulent operations that the prosecution was spotlighting. However, the scale and depth of Perlman's fraudulent activities left little room for the defense to maneuver. As the trial progressed, the weight of the evidence and the sheer number of individuals affected by the Ponzi scheme painted a damning picture. The law was catching up with Perlman, his past actions casting long shadows that no legal argument could dispel. The culmination of the legal proceedings saw Perlman convicted on charges of conspiracy, money laundering, and making false statements during a bankruptcy proceeding. The sentence of 25 years in prison was a testament to the severity of his crimes. The unique stipulation by the judge for sentence reduction, one month for every $1 million recovered, was a further indication of the monumental scale of Perlman's fraud and the court's commitment to providing some measure of restitution to his victims. Lou Perlman's trial was more than a legal battle. It was a dramatic narrative that unfolded in the courtroom, a clash of strategies and stories that ultimately saw the law catching up with a man whose ambition and deception had once seemed boundless. 
It was a stark reminder that even the most elaborate schemes eventually unravel, and that justice, though sometimes slow, is inexorable. Despite his criminal activities, Perlman's impact on the music industry remains significant. He played a pivotal role in launching the careers of some of the most iconic pop acts of the 1990s. However, his legacy is marred by the exploitation of his artists and the massive financial fraud that led to his downfall. Lou Perlman's time in prison was notably less documented than his career in the music industry and his trial, but a few details provide insight into his life behind bars. After being sentenced in 2008, Perlman was incarcerated at the Federal Correctional Institution in Texarkana, Texas. While specific details about his day-to-day -day life in prison are scarce, it's known that Perlman continued to be involved in business dealings, albeit at a much smaller scale and under the strict limitations of his incarceration. Reportedly, he even attempted to kickstart new business ventures from prison. One such venture was said to be a plan for a new talent show or boy band, indicating that even while imprisoned, Perlman's entrepreneurial spirit and interest in the entertainment industry persisted. However, Perlman's health deteriorated over the years he spent in prison. He struggled with various medical conditions, which eventually led to his hospitalization. In 2016, while still serving his sentence, Lou Perlman passed away from cardiac arrest at the age of 62. Perlman's death in prison marked the end of a life that had seen astronomical highs in the entertainment industry and catastrophic lows following his conviction for financial fraud. His story remains a complex narrative of ambition, success, deception, and downfall. Join the conversation. Drop a comment to share your thoughts and insights. Don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe for more captivating content. Thanks for tuning in to Really Unreal. Join us next time for another fascinating true crime story. Stay curious, stay connected, stay with Really Unreal.